I believe we left off intrinsic. Well, while we're uh, waiting for good old games to update, perhaps they're hiring a new social media manager. Um, did you hear about this? Or no, what do they do? Is there a... They used a hashtag that's affiliated with the, I think, it, we will not be erased hashtag. That's um, that's going to be some far right group that I don't. Well, it's actually being used to um, articulate the camp the uh, campaign to. Um, I can't really speak to it, on that one. but uh, we're streaming. The, the, yes. Are we using that computer too? No. Okay. Did we? So everything switched back the razor and everything. I think, I think so. They'd set it up. Okay. Yeah, I need to talk to Nathan about. Yeah, you got. It really should just be one setup that we okay. use. But hi, everyone who's coming in on our conversations. We're chatting about this stuff. Yeah, a bit of a mess today. How are you going? Hmm. What happened to Virginia? <laughs> Oh, there we go. Oh, there it is. Uh, welcome to Classic Quests. We're here at uh, UWM and the Center for 21st Century Studies in the Digital Cultures Collaboratory. And my name is Chris. I'm a PhD student here at the University of Wisconsin Milwaukee's English Department. I'm Thomas Malaby. I'm a professor of anthropology here at UWM. I'm <clears throat> Scott Bruner. I'm also a PhD student at the University of Wisconsin Milwaukee. So we're continuing on with Ultima 4. We had a uh, little delay here when we started. <laughs> so so, so that we were yeah. caught up in a lot of conversation. Uh, but. Yeah, so I think we're intrinsic. I have my horse again. Intrinsic that I guess. Got a pun built into the game, probably. <laughs> Red Dead Redemption 2 comes out this week. Oh, wow. And apparently, if your horse dies in the game, it's dead for good. And that's received Ooh. an interesting amount of press. Horse right. permadeath. <laughs> <laughs> the graphics, not that I want to get into, but also, it does have that. And also, the modeling of the horses is so accurate, down to its, uh, you know... Genitalia. And... In cold weather, they become smaller in the game. Oh that is gosh. how realistic. Are you the kidding game. me? That is what I have been told. Uh, I'd already, I'd already read that they were modeled realistically, but then to find out that they actually react to the weather around you was a level that. I keep wanting to make a pun about how the the studio has not been cavalier. They're treating it. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. But it was, we hear all these stories about rock star employees and how they had to work 100 hours. You just think yeah. about that poor guy who was in charge of the shrinkage <laughs> during the water. Like, this is why you didn't see your family for three go, weeks. Go do some research on to how, what is the difference when the temperature drops 10 degrees. In the, yeah, uh, that's when I start worrying about the FBI raiding my offices and looking at hard drives. And... <laughs> no, seriously, it was for research. I was doing research. I, I, I will quickly, I don't play, I, I mean, I have no time at all, but I, uh, an unabashed, huge fan, despite the fact that it's problematic, of the first Red Dead Redemption. I love that game. Is it? No, I've it never played it. Yeah, oh. I played it too. Yeah. I, really good. I've always enjoyed the, uh, Grand Theft Auto games, and I, so am I mistaken that Red Dead Redemption is just Grand Theft Auto Western style. Grand Theft Horse is uh, that's the joke. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> that's the things that I don't like about the game, right? Uh, there's you know there's a lot of, <sighs> we're supposed to be playing Ultima Four. There's there's a lot of um, there's a lot of violence in the games and a lot of like kind of bizarre um, violence that doesn't have any kind of narrative reason, which is is distracting in many ways. 
But, you know, if it's following some of the, like, Peck and Paul era films, right, I guess that's, to some degree, the super vi- hyper-violence isn't completely un... I don't know. Is it an homage to that? I think they would tell you that after the fact. If you wanted to poke around Trinsic, I actually have very few notes on Trinsic, other than it's for honor. That good looking at and kind of got a, some funky animations. Oh, see now. So do they attack if I chase them? Is that what's going on? Oh. They have a diagonal attack there. So to Trinsic. I've got a chapter on Grand Theft Auto, um, and I mean this isn't really part of it, but it's always been interesting to me how Rockstar kind of reveres American culture. Like it was shocking to me that they were from Mm -hmm. the UK. Well, there's um, boy, I mean, you could talk about a whole bunch of different. Well, interesting reasonings behind that. I don't know, they would just be speculations, but there's all that interesting history of British youth culture and its relationship to um, ideas about labor and um, and popular culture. Done my poor app, Shai. Yeah, I... I remember, like the um, was it the in music? There's the the British wave, mm-hmm. which was modeled off of American R and B. Right. And I remember my Canadian grandfather always grumbling about the Canadians always emulating Americans and mm. just how um, mm-hmm. how much of a problem that w- was. I've always found the sat- satire of American culture and Grand Theft Auto to be, um, and this may not be fair, um, extremely surface level, an exaggeration without any real <laughs> procedural rhetoric argument underlying it. I mean, yeah, I mean, it's like the, I spent a lot of time, like, looking at NPCs in those games, and they're just so... They're ripped right out of your um, 70s. Well, I don't think we were here yet. They're all belligerent. They all don't, they want nothing to mm-hmm. do with anyone. Um, I think this is, isn't this Trinsic? We've been in pause. This is pause. This is pause. I think, I think Trinsic is south of here. <laughs> Yeah, I want to do spreadsheet because that way we can quickly search and maybe I'll even bring it up the laptop from time to time. Maybe I should have a laptop here. I have one. I mean, we did all Yeah, I feel like I have cut pause covered. Is we did learn the gate spell. Is there a heal, healer in pause? I have market armor fallen. Tavern. Oh, I didn't see that actually died. Oh, did she? Oh. Where was, where is Trinsic in relation to the... I, so I, I think it's, you almost went through it. If you go down, I wasn't paying super attention before, but yeah, around here and then down. Around the water.
and then east from here down a little bit is it through there okay. I think it's right below. down or right there maybe this right I think it's gonna be through there keep your spreadsheet <laughs> <laughs> All right, so <clears throat> so this is for, for honor, and that is the only notes I have. Now we're southeast from Britannia. Hmm. Kind of like at a uh, Walmart. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's just a greeter. <laughs> I see try honor, seat. try transic. Wisdom on the virtue of honor is found throughout this town. Towny, not this town. <laughs> <laughs> Enter and find thy path. So I'm going to bring up. <clears throat> I was talking to a student today from the conferences, and we ended up talking because um, he he was also a gamer. I was talking about how I don't understand Twitch in general, the idea of watching people play video games. Um, and I, we, we actually we were, I was talking about Dungeons. Oh, we were talking about Critical Role. That's how it started, oh, yeah. and how like I can't watch Critical Role these three hour. Despite the fact that people are very pretty and they're, you know, very talented in like creating their characters to life, I'm wondering why I'm not playing Dungeons and Dragons myself when I watch this show, hmm. right? And he's like, well, he's like, he's but, like, well, maybe it's, this is the way that people that can't play right. do people it. Like and me. I, I never like considered this. that. Yeah. Okay. I don't have a group that I, I I play with my kids and stuff. Yeah. But that's I mean it's a lot of work and I'm the DM and I hate being the DM. I'm I'm like the reluctant <laughs> DM. I'm really? The DM because somebody needs to DM, you know. I would much rather play. I haven't played played except for the games with Leia, you know. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, I, I, and mostly I listen to Critical Role while I'm driving around. Really? So that, because it's not that much you need to watch, you know. And I like it just pure audio. Um, so definitely it plays the role of, you know, I don't get to play, but I can find the time to tune in while I'm driving around town or driving to the south side or whatever. Without constant care, it will soon tarnish. Does that mean that we can lose on it? Like, I've never watched Critical Role. I've been told I should. I've watched about five minutes and go, eh, I'm just not. I, it, it feels too much like watching Wheel of Fortune or a, a game show to me. Mm. And How so? Not because I'm watching people, other people play like, and have yeah. fun. And yeah. while it, it makes for good like water cooler talk afterwards... I mean, but I don't, I would rather be playing something else myself, I guess. I'm mm -hmm. in the same well, kind the of whole watch me, watch me play a thing. Yeah. As TL's book well, says. Here's my question. Is Twitch something that's cultural? Like, would people from, you know, my generation, is, is there something specifically, specific to Twitch's demographic that makes people watch games where I can't understand? Or... It, is it I don't think so because we did play games together but I don't find that community aspect because I think we talked about this you used to play interactive fiction yeah we've played with other folks we play adventure games it's always great to have another perspective on an adventure game puzzle but I don't find Twitch mirrors that community I don't think we're playing no, no, together no. I, th I would connect it to a completely different uh, um, lineage which is uh, first of all uh, televised sports and then reality television and then Twitch, right? So it is cheap to televise sports. It is very cheap to do reality show television. There's a lot cheaper than having people write scripts, to actually doing the expertise laden, edited, curated, you know, a good drama, a good comedy. That, that's expensive, right? Mm -hmm. But the whole trend in television has been to follow the model essentially of, of televised sports, which is hey, it's kind of built into the system that there will be meaningful outcomes generated here. We don't need to script it beforehand. 
We've learned how to do it in sports, right? In other words, it's like it's a kind of compelling entertainment because it's it's a game mediated, you know, that is a lot cheaper to produce than a scripted novel or a scripted film or television show, right? So to me, Twitch fits into that. We shouldn't look at it and think about our own gaming experiences and why am I on Twitch. We should say we're, we're watching Twitch because it's like watching Top Chef or it's like watching the NFL or it's like watching, you know, Big Brother or something like that. Um, I was... A project I've been kind of chewing on is a... A, sim, a lineage, but kind of, but different, that stems from where Twitch is another iteration of public access television. Mm hmm. Yeah. Where it's this kind of amateur hour, the worst direct you could find out there for public display, and there it is. And, and which is like YouTube, early, yeah, early yeah. YouTube. Yeah. And so I'm reading, and it's not very good, and I, so I, I'm not actually reading it anymore. Because uh, I couldn't finish it, <laughs> but Videocracy by the cultural CEO or whatever for YouTube, oh. and he's just the it's just this uh, raw 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 yeah. stuff. Yeah. And so it's a little bit gross to read, but I mean, what comes across is this how the priority for YouTube very early on was to have this kind of open access produce content and everyone could be on everyone has a voice that can be heard and twitch is just this well youtube is also doing this kind of um the convergence of gaming technology networking technology kind of coming together gaming just becomes the the vehicle mm -hmm. for the conversation which produces data for Amazon and yeah, I mean, I definitely can understand. I mean, I've certainly I can understand the cheap argument, the fact that you know, like Facebook or any of these platform capital platform, you know, Nick Cernichek's uh, term for platforms that create the content themselves, so you don't have to create a content for it. I do get that, but I still don't understand why the content is necessarily compelling. Like, it, 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 it is it because of reality TV and because of Facebook has taught people a lexicon has practice to finding these things compelling work. Well, you might do you ever see private parts that movie with Howard Stern's a movie, time ago. right? And there's this this moment which I have no reason to believe isn't drawn from real experience where his competitors are think or somebody who hates him is like enlisted some survey guy to like find out why Howard Stern is successful, you know. And all the people who who lo who love Howard Stern what's their main reason for continuing to listen to his show? I want to see what ha what he says next, <laughs> right? Well, all the people who don't like it, but listen to it anyway, why are you listening to the show? I want to see what he's going to say next. You know, there's a built-in kind of quality of like, I'm going to sit here even though these five minutes are boring mm -hmm. and the next five minutes are boring because there might be a very meaningful moment that I get to be a part of. There's something about live broadcast in particular, which is why, you know, watching pro sports when it's live is different from watching just, you know, uh, a rerun of reality TV or watching it. You know, reality TV is kind of in between, right? Because it's edited, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, and, and pro sports is, of course, mediated, right? But I, I mean, this is, I don't, may just be my own bias because it's how I look at games, but I think the contrived contingency of something that has a game as a part of it invites a kind of, oh, well, we don't know what will happen. We know that there's there's a built-in twist around every corner, you know, uh, and we it could be that there'll be the oh my gosh, and I was there. I felt a metonymic relationship mm -hmm. to that happening right now and tomorrow at the water cooler. Were you were you tuning in when X happened, kind of thing? Yeah, sort yeah. of like the wardrobe malfunction at the Super Bowl kind of moment, you know. Yeah. <laughs> You know, something like that. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm wondering if the, the more interesting point of conversation, and this probably isn't a general thing, but is if it's the bad calls and those pushbacks against the rules of play or the victory or the play itself. I mean, because I'm thinking of 
the the takeaway moments from any football game I've ever watched or baseball, it's the bad calls. Sure, it's, it's either one, it, right? Because either one is is contingent and significant. Where, I mean, does a computer game inhibit that though? I mean, because I, I mean, the very very little Twitch conversation that I've seen has very little to do with the game itself. Mm-hmm. It's almost this kind of self reflexive. Oh, here we are in this mess. Um, and these are larger streamers right. where I don't know how. From what little I've heard, like part of a good streamer, like the big streamers, when they, part of what they do and do well isn't even the playing of the game. Well, right. I, I mean, you have someone like Seagull for Overwatch, right? Mm-hmm. Who is both a very talented uh, interactor with his audience, yeah. you know, but he's also unbelievable, you know, at the game, mm-hmm. his game sense, right? And, and play, players who are uh, in a game like that. You know, you are in part watching to see. Oh my God! Yeah, did, he did that. You know, <laughs> but I think you're. I think you're right in the sense that certainly, you know, what I'm talking about in a kind of ideal, typical sense of what's kind of in the structure of Twitch and, and in the audience's expectations, it's certainly not exhausting what Twitch is and has become. Right, because you you can in, include in that things like you know speed runs and stuff like that is in part about is this person going to succeed on this or not but it's also just about the display of mastery yeah. you know it's like watching a juggling act you that know I get. That um, I and then there's other things which are much more community based you know like the mental health stuff that has started to come on there and players who've become known because of their ability to converse about a particular topic or create a welcoming community around a particular kind of identity and then that's that's very much part of it. Yeah. So I wouldn't want to. I'm not trying to throw out the things that are that are not relying on the game structure as game as as sort of relevant to what makes Twitch Twitch. But I I think it's important we don't that we pay attention to that yeah. things too. You know. <coughs> Did you catch this, Scott? The intrinsic when you sleep at the inn, there's a locked door. That might be something we have to get back to. Yeah, I'm gonna. I, I I'm gonna start printing. I will, I'll put a spreadsheet to that. So with AppShay, do we have no way of AppShay getting AppShay back? I can't remember. We can at some point. Does it cost like two hundred gold or something, or three hundred? Yeah. Well, we found that it actually makes more sense as long as AppShay doesn't mind uh, dwelling within the. In the ether Plutonian realms. Yeah. Um, it's actually cheaper to die. And up here, and get, <laughs> yeah. So there's a there's a there's a procedural rhetoric argument in that. I don't know what it is. <laughs> well, let's hear it. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm gonna make one last bullet point before we left this go because I, w- I was making a note about about the conversation that we're kind of having about Twitch streaming, my own inability to understand it or critical role for that matter. Which is I keep coming back. I keep because this is a, an issue that keeps getting interested in because I've been talking about like, in my game culture class about the how the ubiquity of the, the ubiquity not just of video games but the ubiquity especially mobile gaming has completely changed our relationship to games in general mm-hmm. um, uh, because now people everybody plays more bounded games than they ever have to say they were in fact they were playing games before. I'm always curious like I. I feel like gamification, you know, certainly happening in, in commercial realms, but I think people are looking at things from a gaming perspective everywhere now more. I, the, 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 I suppose play is practice is now making us expect games in areas that we didn't before. Yeah. And of course, you know, we can see that in how commercial platforms are now trying to take advantage of the way that we think about games, right? Candy Crush, but not just games, and anywhere. Um, but I used to think in terms of it was creating almost a narcissism in the fact that now we expect all of our media to be so interactive, right? Um, I always I, I always think of this on a personal level. I'm an only child. I love choose your own books from, from day one. Mm-hmm. The reason I like games is I I had some I, I've always worried that it's a narcissistic quality that I have to change the, 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 the media itself, right? And I wondered if that was also becoming evident in, 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 in the in our regular culture as we get gamified. But Twitch complicates that idea. Because it obviously shows that there's a huge audience of people that don't necessarily want to interact directly with the game, but do want to do it through a vicarious level, through a human subjectivity mediating the game, right? Yep. 
I have nothing to say. I'm just well, I, I would say, I think one of the things that's really important to keep in mind is that when we talk about the rise of kind of game is shaping our subjectivity and our expectations, right, that we, we expect to find games everywhere. It's not just that. We're expecting to find a particular idea about games and the human. And it's not just one, right, but it is overwhelmingly it has been in especially digital games, a particular kind of especially individualized uh, kind of experience around games. And it's one that's very masculine and it's about mastery and it's about a lot of things that we've talked about in Lunch Zone. So while that never obtains, you know, completely and purely for, for everyone around, it's an ideal type, it is it is part of what is has been saturating a lot of the platforms that we've interacted with well. But then notice what, as you're saying, is happening at the same time. Not just something like Twitch, where you know, it invites groups of people to be social together. Imagine that, you know, like as against what Linden Lab imagined for Second Life, which is almost no sociality at all, really, except for look at the cool thing I made, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, but also at the same time, notice the rise of board games. You know, right, I, yeah, the, yeah, yeah, right, and, and the rise of collaborative games. You know, whether it be Rock Band or you know things like that, or Little Big Planet, or a whole bunch of other, right? So, so you get it, it is almost always true that whatever the the uh, prevailing kind of implicit ideology, uh, especially in a kind of mediated environment, digital mediated environment, at the same time, if you look closely enough, human beings are regularly looking to fill out the other parts of their selves, which are not being, where there aren't a lot of affordances for it, right? And it comes in at the edges, you know? So, so I, think, I think you're right, but it's always part of a particular story of what particular account of games or what particular kind of game subjectivity is foregrounded mm-hmm. and imp- imposed upon us in each update we get or each thing we're marketed to play, you know, in Super Bowl ads or whatever. <laughs> and then what people are actually finding their way to in a kind of make-do fashion, not so much like I'm making the intentional choice, I'm not going to be just an individualist gamer, I want to find something else. No, but they're, you know, they're, they're like, well, picking this up over there, and oh, this person, they were playing this game, you know, Pandemic, you know, the other night, and, you know, or Mysterium or something like that. Mm-hmm. And, you know, so that's where I would locate it. Yeah. Well, I said, my younger son said something the other day where we're D&D. walking, and he says, I, I wish... I wish I had an arcade to go to because I've talked about this and just, and I always talk about how social it was. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I was never one of those players who ever drew a crowd, but there, <laughs> but there was this there, but you saw other people. Oh, that yeah, were like right. that. And, and even if there weren't people there, when the like high scores were maintained, there was this weird kind of amorphous unknown group there that you were, you were, you were vying yeah. and competing against yeah. these even yourself oh, high scores I mean yeah. on the video game was a big deal at the local arcade where I was well, yeah. you know and you knew I mean there's one person who had a bunch of scores in the game that person actually was like kind of a little bit of a local hero you know I was in Yuba City California in the middle of nowhere and I can tell you you know like the top three names on the, on the asteroids machines which was always cool I just have to that story you talk about people around the arcade one of the most gratifying moments and this is probably says something about my life is I finally got around to watching Stranger Things. And the first oh, yeah, episode... I haven't watched it yet. This won't spoil it. The first episode of the second season has them scrounging quarters from the couch to go play a game. And I'm sitting there with you know with my wife. And I'm like, oh, it has to be Dragon's Lair. It has to be Dragon's Lair. <laughs> and sure enough, that's what I mean. It was gratifying when they're all huddled. Right. That was the yeah, game was when the I was game. a kid. That yeah. if you could play Dragon's Lair, you, you know, that yeah. was... the that was yeah. rock star quality. I remember yeah. Dragon Slayer was right next to Xevious, which almost mm. nobody remembers anymore. <laughs> but that was my game. It was the only game yeah, I ever yeah. mastered. I was the, was the only game I was ever the high score at regularly. That was yeah, mine was mine was Frogger. To this day, I can like reliably get on the high score of Frogger, and I don't Xevious. I loved, um, but that was like Starcade. You know, there were game shows that were built around these uh, video games. So you had like the, those attempts at trying to. Um, yeah, yeah. Market this and, and institutionalize yeah. it, turn it into a sport. Yeah. Well, unless we should just throw a shout out to the Carly Kukuruk book, Coin Operated Americans, because mm. it's directly related to this conversation. It's a very nice treatment of the the um, arcade in Iowa, which became the site of the national high score board that was uh, maintained for a number of years it's, and it's hosted a, a tournament. Came to host a tournament. It's not the same one that 
was featured twin in galaxies. King of Kong. Is yeah, it? twin. Well, it's their and they it was don't in Life anymore. magazine. Oh. Yeah, they don't exist. The arcade doesn't exist no. anymore, but the organization Twin Galaxies does exist. And I'm twin struggling galaxies. with the name of the town. It's like a Wa, but I keep getting come on Wa with toast. It's not. It's Wa. I should know. We, we Wabash. Yeah. No. <laughs> That's Illinois, isn't it? <laughs> I can't remember. It's in Iowa. What comes the we um we were when we drove from San Diego here we were gonna stop by actually take mm. a picture of the street mm. where they take the famous life picture yeah can't remember why we didn't probably because we had a kid in the back who didn't want to talk about gen the gendered nature which she's pretty good at handling I mean you got all the cheerleaders around them yeah like yeah they're, yeah. Like they're what, the varsity winning team what was the social I mean okay so there was arcades here's a little bit of information by the way consoles come Thank you. I don't want to say take over, but well, they do. It's yeah. Basically, the arcades go to the wayside. Yeah. NPCs. Our social arena for around video games now becomes who we can fit in our living room. Yeah. So they're usually people that we know very closely. Right. Or people we want to know more while playing this game or whatever. But we don't get much in the way of socializing with games as kind of the vehicle for that until network technology. And that's fairly recent, isn't it? I mean, I'm kind of throwing half-baked ideas out there. So uh, a few few things, and this is just a sketch, right, of, of sort of how I might connect some of these dots, right? So consoles are there, consoles are there even in the 70s, mm -hmm. right? But the, the graphics, and, and the game selection is so poor compared to what you see at your local arcade. The speed of reactivity and just uh, that it takes years before they're competitive on that score to begin with, right? Mm -hmm. So I think they only start to really be competitive with the Nintendo system mm -hmm. around that era and especially Super Nintendo, right? Mm -hmm. At the same time, arcades are declining for a bunch of other reasons which Kukuric described. It's not just a comp question of competition. Mm -hmm. with home PCs or home consoles. It's also ideas about economic development and racism and a lot of other things that are really interesting in there, actually, mm -hmm. about the campaign against uh, arcade games and, you know, that they're always in the wrong part of town and it's the, it's the upper-middle-class white kids who want to go to the arcade, but mm -hmm. they're often dissuaded from doing so and it becomes kind of part of the site of a moral campaign. So there's a lot more around it than just the question of competition. But in addition to that, as those consoles are coming on, they 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 are social, but I mean, aren't they all two player? I mean, I I, I think we have to get to the arcade games or no consoles? the consoles. When does well, the, when does yeah. four player come on? It comes on with the uh, GameCube, maybe is that four player? Neo no. Geo, I think. Neo yeah. Geo, right? Which is which is super expensive. Yeah, and it's I think what makes the Neo Geo significant is that it is built off oh, of arcade the, Right, technology. the chipset. Yeah, yeah, especially things like, what, Street Fighter and stuff like yeah. that, as I recall. So, so I, yeah, I, I think there were a lot of things that got in the way of a console game. So it becomes, at least, now other people may have a different experience, but to me it was a much more family kind mm -hmm. of soci sociability than invite people over. Yeah. Now, now, also, at the late 80s and early the 90s, are land parties happening. Right, people are actually taking mm -hmm. their whole computer, yep. right, I've done to that. play mm -hmm. Doom or Counter Strike or whatever together in the '90s. Counter Strike was later, but um, so I, you know, in terms of the sociability angle, I think there were a lot of uh, limitations, hardware, graphics, and otherwise, that kept it from being accommodating enough people mm -hmm. and having a uh, a kind of satisfying game experience in that. You know, that's just my first stab at a few dots to connect in that. Yeah, I would also throw conventions in there and events that brought it, like the LAN party, right. um, I'm, which I miss tremendously. <laughs> I will never forget, take, I had an, a Macintosh LC like this big and literally putting it in the back of my car when I was 24 years old to lug it to some, <laughs> I can't believe I did that. And I'm mean, just lugging it up. This is San Francisco. So I'm oh, lugging geez. it up somebody's like two flights up the stairs. Right. Just to be able to play marathon was the game we were playing. Mm -hmm. See, what I think of is, a, is a, something very much like that, but a little bit later, which is when we would have these conferences like State of Play, which is a virtual worlds conference, or Games Learning and Society Conference, GLS in Madison, 
the whole Terra Nova crowd would be there. There, I mean, like half the guild yeah. for a World of Warcraft, and we would stake out some big room, and everybody had their laptops and other things. We did it once at Palo Alto Research Center, hmm. and we and I, I, I they, Nick Ducheneau wheeled in this gigantic monitor, on, you know, and he said, "Anyone want to use this?" And nobody raised their hand. I was like, "Sure, I will." There's like a picture <laughs> online somewhere of me like with this gigantic thing with my, and it was like too much real estate for me to get my eyes over, like to keep pay attention to what we were doing, but it was exactly a similar kind of feel like everybody's in the same room even though we have played obviously from our own homes Mm -hmm. for a year or two now we're all actually in the room together taking down Karazhan or whatever it was I think it's I don't know I'm so hung up on this idea is like is that more or less social like it's like okay so we had 10 people and we all have these great stories so when we talk about land parties it's like we all kind of remember we took a lot of effort to get these things and they were all fairly fun uh, but now we have Twitch streams, so if somebody watches, you know, one of the popular Twitch streams, we could have thousands and thousands and thousands of people. Is that now more social because the people that are on there? Um, Definitely not. I mean, not phenomenologically, yeah. right? I mean, there's. I, I'm I'm the first person to say that I think mediated um, interactions, such, such as you know, a, a Karazhan run when no one was playing in the same room with anyone else, could still be a, a very powerful and intimate experience with a bunch of other people that led to the surge of oxytocin and the other things that anthropologists like to talk about you know you take down the last boss you know we finally took down the last boss for the first time and and there was like we're all on voice chat together and and it was not a rare thing in those moments for somebody to say i I love you all you know like (laughs) there's this there's this wonderful kind of like feeling so so i'm not the person to say that that's not possible but but i do think that the mediated social interactions uh, generate a lot of challenges that immediacy, co-presence, kind of what do we doesn't mean? have to deal with, right? Mm-hmm. Um, the bandwidth is very rich. You know, as human beings, there's, there's ideas, and I'm going to get anthropological here, right? But there's ideas about, uh, you know, what separates us from, like, chimpanzees, right? Uh, well, two things in particular, and uh, language, but facial expression. Mm. Now, uh, Robin Dunbar did a lot of this research. Chimpanzees can maintain social ties, trust ties, with about 40 members of a group. How do they do it? They're grooming each other. A lot, Mm. right? But that's the limit. You can't get bigger than that because the amount of time you have to groom enough people to sustain your trust relationships is not big enough, right? But he's able to show, somewhat convincingly, that there's a number roughly around 150 which is what human beings can sustain over time, intimate moral relationships with about that many people. Well, how do we do that? Why is our number not 40? Why, why, well, we're not grooming everyone all the time. Thankfully. And he said, thankfully. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, it's language and facial expressions, the ability to read other people's faces. It's extremely important, right, to establish trust at a distance. Mm-hmm. And language helps us establish trust at a distance. And coordinated activities help us establish trust at a distance, right? So you, it's not like that stuff can't happen in mediated ways. But if you're all in the same room together, that stuff's a lot easier to overcome. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I'm, I, mean, I'm, I, I mean, I definitely didn't think that Twitch was more social, but I was curious how we determine that. And I'm glad to know that there's a scientific reason for, like, co I've mean, never this on this term, so it to me as well. Right. Um, that justifies. But how do we land on the number one hundred and fifty? Did how do, how do we figure that? Wasn't out? there someone who was it that said you have like you have a family, and you have space for like there are different levels of social sociability going on there. Mm-hmm. Number of different family, people. So friends, that, yeah. and then yeah, there's one of the, one of the famous ones is Marshall Solins who writes about exchange okay. uh, and gift exchange and, and trade and things like that. And you've got these different sort of circles of intimacy. Um, but you, you, interestingly enough, you know, you've got people who kind of want to, maybe it's just purely temperament and genetics, people who want to kind of stay closer to the center. But then you also mm-hmm. have people who want to range at the edges, yeah. you know, and they want to take risks. They want to try and establish ongoing recipro- reciprocal relationships with someone, even though that person may, may screw them over, mm-hmm. you know. And uh, this, yeah, sociability works. I mean, there's a lot of ways yeah. to talk about it in those terms. It's not, you know, you can't. You don't want to be reductive about it in this way, but it's a helpful way to talk about uh, our sociability. And, you know, you get into collective effervescence and stuff like that. That's basically what I was talking about with the raids, right? Durkheimian collective effervescence can happen in something like World of Warcraft, but it doesn't happen everywhere online. It doesn't happen in a 
you know, a Twitch, uh, or a tw uh, Twitter war. It doesn't happen in a necessarily right. It, there's a lot of mediated interactions where you not don't really have a chance at. I just I, I'm I'm I don't want to use personal example again, and yet that's exactly what I'm going to do. It's funny to mention the Warcraft and the different social relationships because I think we can apply it to games because. The way that I played World of Warcraft is very different than the way my wife played World of Warcraft. I could never really figure out World of Warcraft. I always played with my best friend. And we would actually, and we had played, you know, we played a lot of, we played Ultima Online together. Mm. And we always role play, right? So we would play our characters and talk in character, and we would have fun with it. I mean, we're, we're two yeah. pretty fairly funny guys. But we would talk to everyone and other, other characters. We never understood what people were selling or talking about in like the grid group chat channels. We never, we tried to join guilds, but people, you know, we couldn't, we couldn't <laughs> interface. Meanwhile, of course, my wife is, you know, has these, and now she has these significant, um, you know, actual, like, real-world relationships with people that were in her guild. She raided, she had five characters at level right. 90 where my characters never got past 35 because usually that's where I wouldn't, couldn't access things. But I'm, I guess my point was just, it's, it's, it, I'm, I'm thinking illustrations of what you're saying about the additional social relationships, but they can even happen on a virtual basis, they right? Can. Like we, um, the way that we interact with people can be, I think, illuminated by the way that we interact in an online space, I think. To me, it's been a huge challenge in this area to try and sustain what my advisor used to call the militant middle ground. <laughs> How do we avoid, you know, sort of jumping on some bandwagon that says, oh, you know, our sociability in World of Warcraft is just, is just as valuable as our sociability elsewhere. There's nothing different about it. It's just as attainable. And, but also avoid the other end, which says, well, you know, only offline human relationships have any real <laughs> yeah. integrity. I mean, it, it's so <laughs> difficult, right? But but the, the truth has got to be in the middle, you know? And we need we need to be particular about it, not categorical. Yeah. All right. All right. It's 210. Yeah. That's it. Did we... I'm well, we, we found out it. something. We did. Found out where it's from. We never made it out of transit. Are we, are we, are we <laughs> wrapping it up for I the day? Yeah, wrapping yeah, it okay. up for the day. I promise next time we will, we are going to stay focused on. Hey, I, I I personally like this as a chance to just talk about the stuff we find interesting. So some days it'll be more about the game, some days it'll be more about whatever we're chewing on. You know? Yeah, that's I. You know, I spend most of my time. Um, what's the quit and save? You know, I I go to English conferences, especially like writing and composition. Um, and there's all the, the biggest frustration anymore is this notion that all like we talk, going back to gamification that games can solve pr yeah. problem X right. and all of these issues that we've been dealing with as writing instructors can be solved if we do this and it gets so aggravating because there is that tendency to just lump everything in like every like this generic player yeah Mm -hmm. And this playing model. I mean, if, there, if there's anything that we've cool. talked about, have to quit. it's that we play all of these games so differently. Um, you just lost Valor. Well, I quit and you saved. You quit and so oh, That's right. That's right. Sorry. But I... You're, you're Finish your thought there, Chris. I was getting distracted by what we found. Oh, out. yeah. Unfortunately, I was too. Um, well, what's interesting, I mean, that that's one thing, positive thing about Twitch, is that you do get to see different styles of play and different styles of... I mean, you get to see good players. You also get to see a lot of bad players, and which is, I think, important. Um... I mean, even more so the bad players. <laughs> and just how they interact with games in um, unconventional or uh, ways that the game wasn't intended to to be played. Mm -hmm. People, how long do you, how long does somebody watch a Twitch stream? You sit down, is it like television? You can watch it in like two hours and you like binge it or do you watch one game session what are people's habits watching I should probably, could probably look it up but I'm, now I'm curious there's a great site I posted on the Slack channel we're still streaming too alright thanks everybody yep